Confounding Factors and Outcomes in Cross-Sectional Studies. During this session, you will learn to recognise when a variable may be a confounder and what can happen when confounding is present. Much of epidemiology is concerned with establishing associations between exposures and the risk of disease. Confounding is about alternative explanations for the effect seen between the exposure of interest and the outcome. With confounding, the investigator wishes to remove or prevent the influence of the confounding factor in order to get nearer the truth. This is done either through choice of study design or by adjusting or controlling for the confounding factor in the statistical analysis. For a factor to be regarded as a confounder, the rules are the factor must be associated with the exposure being investigated and the factor must be independently associated with the disease being investigated. In addition, the factor must not be on the causal pathway. What does this mean? An example of this would be retinal vascular changes and diabetic retinopathy. These vascular changes, which are a result of being diabetic, lead to diabetic retinopathy. That is, this is on the causal pathway. Another example would be inflammatory response and trachoma blindness. Potential confounders include factors that are known risk factors for the disease such as smoking and AMD, or a high density of musca sorbens flies and trachoma, and factors that are proxy measures for risk factors, for example, having an indoor toilet and socioeconomic status. So confounding occurs when the effects of two associated exposures or risk factors have not been separated and it is therefore incorrectly concluded that the effect is due to one variable rather than the other. As we have just said, confounding distorts the true relationship between exposure and disease. When we are conducting a cross-sectional study, we have to collect information on all the risk factors for the disease. Let's use a hypothetical example to look at confounding in more detail. We have recently carried out a cross-sectional study of trachoma infection and we collected information on the following age, gender, number of children, age of children, number of people sleeping in the one room, number of people sleeping in the one bed, toilet facilities, availability of water supply, how many times per day they wash their faces, household income, educational level, employment status. We also asked participants if they owned a goat and, if they did, if they drank the goat's milk. When we analysed the data, we found that there was a lower prevalence of trachoma infection in those who owned a goat and drank the milk than in those who did not own a goat. We're very excited. We may have found an easy way of reducing the transmission of trachoma. So are we correct in concluding that drinking goat's milk protects against trachoma infection? No, not at all. When we look at the data, owning a goat and thus having goat's milk to drink, it is found to be highly related to socioeconomic status. Those who own a goat have more money than those who do not. That is, they have a higher socioeconomic status. In this population, the majority of households who own a goat also have a latrine and access to an adequate water supply. Thus, the association between drinking goat's milk and trachoma is being confounded by socioeconomic status. We must always ask ourselves, what is the exposure that we are examining? In this example, the exposure of interest is goat's milk. This exposure is being confounded by socioeconomic status. Drinking goat's milk is related to socioeconomic status. And if we adjust for socioeconomic status in the analysis, the effect of drinking goat's milk will disappear. Confounding occurs when the effects of two associated exposures or risk factors have not been separated. Therefore, it is incorrectly concluded that the effect is due to one variable 
rather than the other. Not all factors that are believed to have an effect on disease actually lead to confounding. Sometimes the exposures can be correlated as in our example, but not always. For example, if we are looking at smoking and AMD, age is not correlated with smoking, but it is a confounder. In summary, you should now be able to recognise when a variable may be a confounder. It is important to examine the association between an exposure and a disease critically. A confounder must be a risk factor for the outcome, disease, associated with the exposure being examined, not be an intermediate step in the causal pathway.